would hate to have to decide who stays up and who goes down. Well, that would not be necessary, Mr. President. Could easily be accomplished with a computer. And the computer could be set and programmed to accept factors from youth, health, sexual fertility, intelligence, and a cross-section of necessary skills. Of course, it would be absolutely vital that our top government and military men be included to foster and impart the required principles of leadership and tradition. <laughs> Actually, they would break prodigiously, eh? There would be much time and little to do. <laughs> but uh, with the proper breeding techniques and the uh, ratio of, say, 10 females to each male, I would guess that they could then work their way back to the present gross national product within, say, 20 years. All right, cool. Uh, hello, welcome to Spine Crackers with Matt, Paul, and Gabe. We didn't say our names before. I, and I, that feels like another one of these, like, r- rules of podcasting. But honestly, we're the bad boys, so we don't, I'm we don't, we don't do it. <laughs> we don't do it every time. Uh <laughs> And today we are going to discuss Nazi literature in the Americas, the title of a short book by Roberto Bolaño. Um, I chose this book, A, because I had only read 2666 and The Savage Detectives before this, and I was a fan. And uh, I'd been meaning for a long time to catch up on some of the, like, the, the stuff that got published in the U.S. anyway, like after his death in 2003 uh and also half as a joke because i had picked Yumesville uh last time and i thought it'd be funny to just have sort of a nazi theme running through <laughs> through my picks for whatever reason yeah, yeah. really oh, yeah. really really funny uh, joke just a hilarious joke and <laughs> you all are laughing really funny joke yeah <laughs> yes for for whatever reason Matt, of course. just <laughs> yeah it's just funny it's just a goof guys anyway Okay, just like Pepe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. True. Younger does get just like your shouts out in this book. Just like your, uh, he does. He is like three. Yeah, he's got the he of the real authors mentioned. He's got probably the most shouts out in this particular book. It's funny because I, uh, I feel like the I feel like we've mentioned the Yumesville discussion so many times already but we did not record it it's gonna be like the it's gonna become like the fucking lost episode (laughs) it's like we're never gonna never gonna actually release i mean thank fucking god and we we will never uh redo that episode either for the listeners pleasure ever patreon you guys i'll sit up patreon tier 50 ten thousand dollars a month to force paul to read umesville again yeah this would be like oh. cock and ball torture for him to have to do this. I would actually rather le- read. I thought you time. would. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> come on now. What you mean by Carl? Back, isn't it? You well, yeah. I mean, well, well come on. It's a secret, but it's <laughs> it's a joke. Well, that's kind of the theme, right? Is like a little bit one of them. Well, so the... what's this book about? Oh, right doy um well it's it's i guess the quickest way i could think of to describe it is it's a it's a fake it's an encyclopedia or uh you know just kind of catalog of various uh fictional authors who are in the non-existent genre of nazi literature but i'd say like more accurately it's like right-wing conservative and fascist kind of writers uh i wouldn't say that genre is non-existent but or it's just it doesn't have like it's not like an actual a thing people say it's it's existent which i think is the point is like uh you know in in these many guises and i think part of the book is a lot of these people are 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 thinly veiled i believe versions of other real people or amalgamations of real people and either way the point is to just be like this is maybe fiction but also this is to demonstrate how this this stuff continues to like spread its its tendrils throughout all types of literature yeah and culture yeah so th- it's 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 very sort of non there's no th- there's no plot there are no 
there are plenty of characters, but there's no like story, right? It's 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 essentially a fictionalized encyclopedia, basically of right. Well, they're kind of like a, they're like snippet summaries and like slash biographies most for most of the time. It's like like either one page to like on average five pages of a of an author's life. Right. And then towards the end there's some longer chapters, but they're uh basically biographies, I would say. Yeah. And I would I would also say oh sorry. Oh no go keep you you keep going. I was just gonna say that like not all of them write about uh nazi themes necessarily like like i would say half of them end up just having like nazi influence that doesn't necessarily re uh reflect their writing but it's like it's more about how these particular characters or writers like had nazi beliefs yeah like, especially think, the first few yeah i think that's a really good point <clears throat> that it's it's I, I think you're probably right paul i would say maybe the majority if if not maybe a little bit less half or so of the people described in the book are not like ex not what you would call like nazi writers but they're all sort of playing with nazi themes like a lot of them are are sort of interested in questions of sort of like purity and national identity and like returning to some sort of idyllic past uh, that's been corrupted by this or that political or, or racial influence, uh, you know, miscagenation and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it, or they have sort of this, these random sort of personal connections to, um, you know, the Nazi regime, you know, one person apparent, like, I think it's, it might be the first woman that's talked about. She was in, in Germany during Hitler's reign and like had her picture taken with him. He's holding her as a baby and that yeah. becomes like her most sort of treasured possession over the course <laughs> of her life. Right. They describe yeah. if, if her like mansion was on fire and she had to go get one thing, it was probable she'd go get that beautiful like gilded picture of her with, with the Fuhrer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I once again found uh, this stuff like nominally dark, but also I found it like funny and disturbing in equal measure. I agree. Which is one of my favorite feelings. <laughs> I, I would say it's one of the feelings that like most accurately feels like uh, or one of the, ah, that's redundant, but like that sensation hits as close to home as I can think to like most of my what intuitions about the world or like human experience in general. Tragic comedy. I'm just trying to say tragic right. comedy. Right. Yeah. I think the other thing that I that I really enjoyed about this, I mean, is that, you know, it's it's it 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 feels just like such a and we can get into reading some some specific passages later, but like as in summary, it's such a sort of like like explosion of creativity from Bolaño. It's just like it, it, it's it's all over the place, but there's also these 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 sort of through lines thematically and and um you know in the writing, but it's so diverse and so distinct, and it changes in so many weird ways through the course of the the book. And I think one of the things that he does so well is capture, uh, and this is going to sound like I'm I'm sort of sympathizing with Nazis here, which I am not. <laughs> well, that's going to be the risk the whole time, right? Yeah, that's inherently in reviewing a book like this, I guess. But, you know, I feel like he captures the sort of, um, like, sad romance of Nazism for a certain type of person in a certain type of cultural and historical moment where there was, like, this bizarre, like, sick beauty in, 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 in it. And I think probably, especially for people who were, you know, as most of the people in the book are, were on the other side of the world for most of their lives, who never actually directly interacted with the Nazi regime. Um, right. This sort of abstract conceptual relationship that they formed with it. Uh, and I feel like he, he captures that sort of, you know, romance really, really subtly here. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I... I really didn't know how much South America was influenced by Nazism at all. Like I, I looked up a few facts about like post-World War II 
something like 5,000 war criminals uh, went to Argentina to seek like asylum. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, South America was they a caught it. for Nazis fleeing Europe. Yeah. I, I really had, I was coming into this with like a very American, North American view of this history. Like I just, I had no fucking idea that this happened. I didn't know that they were influenced at all by the by the Nazi party. But I think you're right, Gabe. Like um, it's probably unique to this section of the world only that this romanticism forms between South America and the Nazi party. And I think a part of it might be because they were so far removed from what was actually happening. Um, While well, also, it's, you know, like I, you have to experience it, though, in some way to then romanticize it. Right. So whatever they were getting trickling through, including expat, you know, war criminals and stuff, you know, telling their side of the story. Uh, and then the layers of mystification of just like not having been there, et cetera. Like the whole point is, yeah, these storytelling methods of of spreading that very romanticism and just creating more people that will like are, think they're, you know, I don't know, intrepid heroes of of order. <laughs> yeah, Peterson. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of Jordan Peterson notions in this, and I, yes. I was like, yeah, J- Jordan Peterson would like this if he just picked it up and read this paragraph. He'd be like, but, yeah, oh, this is pretty, this is pretty good. I should do this. I can't do his voice at all. Sixty percent of this really <laughs> resonates. Uh, but like, but what you end up creating are are like romantic nihilists, more or less. Like you know the kind of like death drive people the people who even enjoy a lot of these people even enjoy the notion of of a doomed cause which is not something which is not something specific to you know uh fascism or conservatism at all you know that's that's in equal measure on the left and bolaño in if case people don't know is like himself he was like a super left-wing guy who was in uh in in the thick of it in certain like for certain causes in Chile um, and went to prison and deeply struggled, I think with like the, the, the place of literature and poetry and stuff in, in its political realms, which he didn't separate from literature or art that as much as some people do. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think one of the other things that he does so well here is, is <clears throat> you're right, Matt, that that's one of the main sort of themes he's exploring is how people access or the ways in which literature interfaces with politics. Uh, yeah. And I think that he sh- he really did a, 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 a and the, the, this book is also hilarious. There's so many just yeah. funny moments that he, he, he does this amazing job of like charting the various ways that people arrived at sort of like Nazism, whether it's through, you know, like, science fiction futurism like perfected the perfection of man type stuff through sort of like american american evangelical religious uh uh directions or whether it's someone who's like pissed sports pissed about the management of their soccer team yeah exactly yeah right yeah or i mean uh, the first uh maybe two or three sections or chapters they kind of dealt with nazism and being influenced by nazism more of like a like an apathetic way like this is what my like family believed in they were maybe right wing and it's like a part of my life and i'm not even questioning it i actually thought that the first i think it was the very first uh snippet what was like the most horrifying to me because and the most depressing because this the first uh woman uh, yeah yeah that one awesome (laughs) she uh like she has nazi beliefs but she doesn't really even think about them she just wants to be a writer and it made me think of like uh just anyone who wants to be an artist or writer that kind of like doesn't care about anything political they're just sort of after the fame of being a writer uh it's just like it could be like morally wrong in a way just or it's like a you're at this like this moment where you're just like all I care about is me and I want to make it as a writer. All that matters is that even though I have these beliefs that affect like 
negatively so much in the world, but they just don't care. And I thought I found that to be like pretty demoralizing well, and but also very real. I, th- I think that's one of the big fears, one of the big dangers that Bologna is trying to demonstrate, which is like, uh, yeah, pe- people that like fall in love with the aesthetics of fascism and stuff. I mean, like, hey, sometimes those uniforms look sharp. Uh, you know what I mean? Like people <laughs> like people just really being like, just like looks good. And then the other thing you just described is is like, yeah, people who are who are struggling to be artists and suddenly they certain of their views get bolstered and they get sort of gassed up by regimes uh, for being useful aestheticians of ideology. And then they but they feel like, you know, successful artists and they want to perpetuate these cultural and ideological and political trends that like, you know, enshrine them. And it's like a cycle. That's my uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's good. And again, just to go back to my like, you know, I, I agree. Like I said earlier, I mean, I agree with you, Matt. This was funny and and disturbing, but like, as it progressed, particularly as I was getting sort of towards the end, like my the the the, the dominant emotion for me reading these, uh, you know, summaries of lives was just sadness, and just like like how just just like profoundly depressing all of these sort of lives that were you know able to be summed up in three or four pages and ultimately <laughs> like ultimately were just like delusional and and sad people most of them yeah um, a lot of them meet pretty gruesome ends yeah right exactly and most of them a lot of them meet really violent and and uh violent ends yeah I, and I think that there's so much, I, I mean, I think, you know, literarily, there's so much in here that's really interesting that Bolaño is doing in terms of, a lot of it feels really self-referential to me. <laughs> even in the sense, so like, so so first of all, right, the character, this is not like a fictional world. All of these, most of these characters at some point interact with other real people, right? So there's people who meet Allen Ginsberg in New York City. There are people who <laughs> interact with, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, uh, La Paz and Soa and all these other like sort of, you know, literary- Pablo Neruda. Neruda uh, yeah, all these like literary, real people, real figures. Um, and and it, and maybe, I mean, maybe, we sh- maybe this is skipping ahead a little bit too much, but Bolaño, is in some ways in the final story himself. There's literally a, a character named Bolaño in the last story. So it yes. sort of comes, you know, sort of like permeating the membrane between reality and fiction in like a really direct way that I found like fascinating. And and not only do the characters meet each other occasionally within right. the book, uh, but that, I, I, I haven't read the book, but I know that final story in particular is just he just wrote another novel about that guy oh okay oh, cool uh, what's his name Hoff, hoffman or, or hoffman yeah ramirez hoffman yeah carlos ramirez hoffman right who like briefly figures in a fictionalized version of Bolaño's imprisonment in chile mm-hmm. so yeah it's all it's it's like uh <laughs> One of the things I thought, which uh, kind of unbidden, but I think kind of <laughs> works, is, uh, you know, Bologna is doing this sort of like hyper text intermingled world. I, David Mitchell is another person I know who does this like very overtly. But I was also thinking of Stephen King and the Dark Tower. Yeah. And just like, I mean, Bologna basically has just been grappling. One of the is just evil in its many manifestations. Like, his books always just end up feeling unsettling. They're often about writers, but like, yeah, it just feels like every time it's him trying to like feel out the shape of what the fuck's wrong with, with people uh, and, and sort of what the core evil is that's, that's stopping people from, from not having these beliefs and doing these things to each other. And right. I was, yeah, I was just thinking of the dark tower, like a just sort of literary, a liter- a literal literalization <laughs> of a, uh, Stephen King's entire like evil universe, the Bolaño cinematic universe. 
Oh, please, <laughs> please. I want Disney to get their paws on Bolaño's entire work. <laughs> Strip mine that man's dead body. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I mean, I mean, I think like, but but that's the other thing is that there's so much, and this is a term that we that we probably abuse on this podcast, but there's so much world building and so much lore in this in this text. There are there are fictional publishing houses, there are fictional literary movements, there are fictional uh, you know, like like um shadowy organizations publishing Nazi literature from behind the scenes that that to this day nobody knows where you know who who is behind it and mm. i mean i think one thing that i wanted to, to to just note is that the the writing of this book we don't really know like when this book is being written from as it were because yes. for, for each author um there's a you know date and place of birth and date of place of death and some of them go up to past present day i think this book was published in uh, 1999 originally maybe 98 um but some of them go up to you know the date of death is listed as 2029 so there's like yeah. a sort of like future oriented like the, there's it implied futurism in sort of where this book is being written from which i thought was really interesting yeah you the yeah. the it's like yeah it, it's disorienting um even though most of these people tend to be have been born or influenced by a, the generation prior all around, you know, the locus is still the thirties and forties, right. I would say. Um, yeah. The, the, like whoever the fuck is compiling this shit and writing this for whatever reasons is like in, yeah, at, at least 2030. Uh, yeah. It feels like it could be like a, just like a document someone picked up, you know, and they were just reading these summaries in like a, a weird bio biographical encyclopedia or something from the future. Um, I thought the 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 uh, there's a little bit of an omnipresent narration going on too, especially when he talks about everyone's deaths. Did you pick up that like he'll be talking about how someone's dying and he'll be like, and the he died listening to like this particular record or something. Right. I was like, how the hell, how the hell would this person know that? Would how would anyone know that? Um, which I thought was interesting, and then when when the when it shifted and he was actually like protect, like in the last story, it kind of threw me off. I was just like, "How am I supposed to read this?" Right <laughs> it, it, there, there is a really weird uh, tone shift partway through, um, where it goes from like it starts out the first at, you know at least half, if not more, of the book is this very objective, very sort of you know, interspersed with those moments, Paul, like you said, of like odd specificity and, and whatever, but it's all very encyclopedic and objective. But then by the time you get to the last story, it's fully written in first person describing events that he was directly involved in. Like I did this, I did that. Yeah. And there are, are there are another few, few moments uh, between the sort of ha around the halfway point, I would say, and, and, and that last story where the tone kind of shifts and it starts to sort of be like a, a little bit less objective, a little bit less just encyclopedic description. Um, and yeah, by, it becomes a story yeah. again. What? It just sort of becomes, he just starts writing a story. Right, exactly. I was, oh, fuck, I lost it. I was trying to find, there was such a funny, uh, there's so many hidden gems in the in the sort of back pages of, of oh the, I love uh, that was some of my favorite reading. <laughs> well, especially like the the publishing house just called the Fourth Reich. The uh, Fourth Reich in Argentina. Yeah, but I fucking lost it. Yeah. So this is uh this one is and this is one that's mentioned a couple times in the uh, uh in the actual text as well. It's a, it's like a shadowy, this is what I was referencing earlier. It's like the shadowy publishing house. It's on 214, Matt, if you're looking for the, the reference in the actual, like, um, Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, fuck, hold on, sorry. God damn it. Oh no, I'm thinking of history and thought. Never mind. But the description of, uh, of the two guys, fuck. 
Hold on, keep talking. I'm going to find this. <laughs> well, so, 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 I mean, I, what we're talking about for, for dear listener is after the, the main text of the sort of um, encyclopedia entries for the individual people is a sort of, it's called, he calls it an epilogue, epilogue for monsters, which I think is an interesting term to use for that. But it's, it's basically a set of appendices where he's talking about like lesser known, less important, he calls them secondary figures, um, many of whom are mentioned in the text, but not they don't they don't merit their own their own uh, encyclopedia entry. There's a section about publishing houses, different magazines, um, and then the last section is just basically a, a bibliography, a list of all the books that are discussed throughout the text. Right, and then yeah, and those those section breaks are also a decent. They're also the one time where it's it suddenly is not just this dry recollecting it's 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 loses objectivity and just goes like yeah like monsters right. <laughs> like fucked up people uh so this is actually part of the southern hemisphere literary review uh <laughs> which again all these names just make me laugh yeah but it, it it just like even this small description of like an internal schism in the editorial staff <laughs> is fun is funny where uh it was two people that would represent fascism, an Italian aestheticist swaggering fascism in the case of Arancibia, while Herring Lazo espoused a Spanish Catholic phalangist anti-capitalist fascism. <laughs> <laughs> and they would like get into fights all the time about like what to emphasize. Yes. Yes. And I just think that attention to detail is so, it's mind boggling to sort of just make this entire world with with that level of, precision uh i think is really interesting i mean i wonder what you make of the title of the the quote-unquote epilogue where all that stuff is because he calls it epilogue for monsters not not of or not mm. whatever and i'm I, I was like starting to read it and i was like am i a monster for continuing past this point like is it, <laughs> is it like this, i'm like this self-punishing you know masochistic uh monster for like just literally reading a list of books that don't exist as they're written like without embellishment in a fucking bibliography that doesn't exist well is it like is he doing some fucking like Haneke Michael Haneke bullshit where he's like you're bad for wanting to know even more about these people or something yeah that's kind of that was kind of how I felt <laughs> yeah I don't I don't know I, I mean I think so like I, I think I read this in another review, so but I can't remember what the fuck one. So I'm just gonna say maybe I'm plagiarizing this idea, but like the last line of the whole book is look after yourself, Bolaño, he said and went off. And like I think, you know, Bolaño's fear also was that in grappling with with this kind of stuff and being so obsessed with what the why and the how, uh and 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 empathizing with these people and trying to get in the minds and whatever to be able to write something of as you said this kind of like precise hyper creative super familiar detail he was afraid he was just going to turn into these people yeah and 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 i think that's interesting because the last story is essentially bolaño leading uh basically a nazi hunter to yeah to or aiding a Nazi hunter in finding one of these guys, the the Carlos Ramirez Hoffman. And the Nazi hunter goes in and basically assassinates him and then comes back to Bolaño. And I think that it's almost like, you know, <laughs> it's almost like a Bolaño meditating. I'm like trying to kill the Nazi in his head. You know what I mean? Right. And I, and I but I think there, uh, there is, the appropriate percentage of as you were as you were like saying it was kind of like not wanting to be too sympathetic but i think he's got certain sympathies there as well at at least when it comes to like admitting i suppose that monstrous people can make good art and that's part of what's so confusing about it i mean this being most obvious in the debate about artist and art when those people are people like andrew vox's favorite uh, guy, Roman Polanski. You yeah. know what I mean. <laughs> so well, I, I think he, yeah. I think he sympathizes with his, you know, his culture and his, you know, his country and the countries 
around him in South America that like their cultures were infil infiltrated by Nazism and a lot in a way that like Western culture was influenced by like the Asian countries too. Like um, you can romanticize a culture like a white culture being a minor like a minority centered culture. And for whatever reason, they took a, gra a grasp on Nazism during a certain period of time. And I think he kind of for maybe doesn't forgive them, but he like he does kind of try to un like understand why and questions whether or not that's like, is it the worst thing? Is it horrible? Is it just something that happened? Is it still evil even though it happened? And I, I think they're all like strong questions. It's well, it's like, like, is it still? Uh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I was just say the question is not, is it still evil? I think the question is just like, again, like the artist art debate, like how much of this stuff is, you, you know, are you still able to make art that's admirable and beautiful and transcending and all this kind of stuff without also somehow being in, <laughs> uh, implicated in the full breadth of this person's, you know, self and like are those ideas getting in there somehow right Which yeah is the debate people have been having about you know prominent like not has it stopped yeah forever i mean like you know if you think about someone like heidegger who's like right. ar arguably the most influential philosopher of the last you know couple hundred years hundred years or so uh who was an avowed nazi and people have been saying like well you know I mean, that, there's a whole sort of like philosophical cottage industry of t trying to tease out where Nazism wormed its way into his his thinking in ways that he probably maybe wasn't even aware of. I think the whole thing, what Bolaño is doing is sort of like, it's sort of like an anthropology via fiction exercise. Like he's doing a sort of like anthropology of these cultures and these people um, and sort of trying to understand the ways in which Nazism and, and sort of, you know, far right fascism in general uh, worms its way in to, you know, daily life and thinking and art. Right. Yeah, and it's one thing that it came across too is that like, even within the literary world in this fictionary little literary world, like, a right wing writer or poet would be ostracized if they were caught or found out. Like it wasn't like the entire culture was like right. infiltrated by Nazism. It was like a smaller section that would still be like called out if they were caught or if they were suspected or something. But it's still interesting that like it was prominent enough to where there, there were so many of these different writers. Um, you know, uh, which made me actually want to like, I, I was wondering like how much of this is true? Like how much, why didn't he actually research actual writers? Like if, if it is an anthro anthropological stance or like, I don't know, whatever. Why, why didn't he actually like research actual people? Wouldn't that be a, like a more concrete explanation of what he was exploring like I, I was a little confused by that like it's so it's very fictionalized like tons of lore tons of <laughs> right. characters and i'm like well this would be a little bit more it would punch me harder if it was if they were real people like how much how much of this am i supposed to believe or i don't know i was a little confused well, i think i think it's intentionally supposed to be a work of fiction because he's exploring this idea through the art form that he distrusts that he's a big advocate for as well. You know, it's like, it, I think this is him, you know, grappling with, with something <laughs> about his own implication in the tradition that includes people like this. And he wants to, I don't know, see if he can, this is sort of like, um, fuck. Again, I, I'm sort of like in unknown territory. I'm not very good at talking about it. Uh, like, I, obviously, the first comparison I thought of was Borges. Uh, who You're not very good at talking about what, Matt? Literature? Like the podcast you have about literature? <laughs> no, no. I, I feel I'm just a little self-conscious about like drawing these comparisons and being able to like... 
Well, because it maybe. feels it feels sort of cringe to be like, oh yeah, Latin writer doing a weird format, Borges. No, I'm not afraid of saying Borges' name. I just like I'm trying to like, all right, and do I have something intelligent to say to follow up on on that further <laughs> than just the name? But I, I, uh, who who, you know, his whole thing. He was way more like hermetic and like kind of a library based guy, but he would write fake what like indices and again bibliographies and accounts of 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 literature and artists that never existed he, via heavy references to things that he would just be reading in in the library because he's a big nerd and uh loser borges is mentioned in the book as well i believe so, somewhere um and definitely uh influence on on bolaño and yeah, I don't know. I think that's it's just a sort of more of a postmodern m- way of exploring Bolaño's own implication in this stuff, and 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 how to find an authorial voice that can be distant while also being critical, or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that you know, it's 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 a sort of. Yeah, I mean, he's he's talking, you know, he's playing with sort of his own legacy and and not, I mean, legacy is a weird word to use at this point in his career, but sort of his his history, his influences, and I mean, and there are a number of sort of, uh, and I'm 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 trying to find some some of the references here, but I have a few, where it's it becomes like. Uh, you know him sort of poking fun at and or questioning the own fo- the, the the very format that he's chosen to use here you know where he he's talking about a couple of writers who sort of um you know just uh let's see here make up like make up names or the, the whole section about the plagiarist who sort of lifts whole cloth like real um real characters to use in his book like real people to use in his book um so this is on 122 to 123, uh, that where, so the, the person that this is, uh, Harry Sibelius, um, who this is not, there's a couple plagiarists, but anyway, he's talking about his writing and he says, the stories are often borrowed as are almost all of the characters. In the third chapter of the second part, Industry and Raw Materials, we find Hemingway's Harry Morgan and Robert Jordan, along with characters from Robert Heinlein and plot devices from Reader's Digest. In the seventh <laughs> chapter, Finance, Section B, German Exploitation of Foreign Countries, the informed reader will recognize a series of characters. Sometimes Sibelius doesn't even go to the trouble of changing their names. Exclamation point. And I'm like, that's that's funny because that's that's what he's doing here. That's what Bolaño is doing in the writing of that is referencing real writers and characters <laughs> without going to the trouble of changing their names, right? <laughs> right. So it's like, I think that goes to sort of what Paul was talking about a minute ago where it's like, uh, uh, you know, there are resonances here with observable reality that are just sort of like glanced off of or hinted at. And I think that that's really an interesting aspect of his writing. I, uh, I loved the, who was the, ah, fuck, I wish I, what, who's the character that was like just writing massive refutations of like Voltaire? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and like Sartre and then like, <laughs> Eventually, he's he's on like part two of like a second thousand page tome about uh Louise Hegel. <laughs> Hegel is he writing about, Hegel. or or like uh, Marx or or Marx or something? And then he's just like he and then he was he was insane. Yeah, <laughs> just like that. I, like I've one of the reasons I I also was interested in this book is just because, um, you know, it feels evergreen in its concerns, but like. It's it's a it's a topic du jour and has been since uh, for a while. Uh, you know the the reignition of of the of Nazis and talking about them and, and this kind of thing, and like especially these trains of thought having. I, you know, I'm hesitant to to talk politics too much because I just don't uh, know a ton. But like, I mean, it's hard to avoid the fact that like go listen to Come Town if you want politics. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> or just or just read Mein Kampf that. <laughs> just get it all cleared up. Finally. Just get it over with. Get it like over a with. crystal you know you bullet. <laughs> but no, just like um 
I, I'm saying like this is a great way to this is a great kind of I don't know description of the reality of the situation of Nazism and similar ideas I don't know metastasizing through culture it's not I just feel like so many people think it's monolithic. I think it's worse than that. I think it's uh, it, it it comes at all these oblique angles, and this is something that like is important if people are to you know be aware of of when this kind of shit is being promulgated under people's noses. Because a lot of these people also get away with it through mystification, occult shit, obscurantism, right. or just being absolutely fucking unpopular and unknown cranks, right. and then being touted later. Um, I'm glad you brought up the guy, uh, uh, Luis Fontaine de Souza, who was writing the, the like insanely long refutation. I was, I was about to say, he's like a Reddit guy. Like he's like, he's the guy who's just like (laughs) infinite threads being like, and another thing, like just going insane. No one's reading it. So I want to read, and I think this is really interesting as a, as a sort of commentary or a question about literature in general and about writing and, and, and philosophy and thinking, because, you know, so this guy is, he spends his life writing these like comically long <laughs> refutations of philosophers. You know, he, he writes, a, he writes like six, in, when he dies, he's right in the middle of writing a six volume refutation of Sartre's being in nothingness, each volume of which is like 700 to 800 pages. It's just like absurd, like laughably long. Um, and, I, right. and this is, and I'm gonna read this paragraph. This is how he dies. This is the end of that s- discussion. And I think it's really sort of, sort of telling challenge to the sort of, you know, the very, the very act of thinking and writing philosophy and all that. So, In 1963, while he was working on the sixth volume, his siblings and nephews were obliged to have him interned once again in the clinic where he remained until 1970. He never resumed his writing. Death took him by surprise seven years later in his comfortable apartment in the Leblon neighborhood of Rio as he listened to a record by the Argentinian composer Tito Vasquez and looked out of the window at night falling over the city, passing cars, people chatting on the sidewalks, lights coming on and going out and windows being closed. (laughs) <laughs> and it's just like, it's just like his whole life is just so clearly pointless in in that moment. Like just writing, writing like 7,000 pages trying to refute Hegel and just right. like, and just looking out and realizing like, fucking fuck, this was all a waste of time. Yeah. Like making Well, that's also, that was, that was also like a perfect example of the, their, the narration I was talking about, like that isn't a simple biographical depiction of what happened. It's very right. like omnipresent. And that, that's, that's one of the ones that took, took me off guard. It was one of the first ones where I was like, this is a little bit off and weird, but I think you're right. Like he does try to, with most of the stories, he tries to show how meaningless most of the, these people's lives were. Right. Even if they were successful. <laughs> As Donald Trump would say, sad, sad. sad. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I was thinking of uh, Jared Taylor. Mm. Okay, so for the listeners who don't know, Matt, let's um, demonstrate your Nazi knowledge even more. Well, okay. I mean, I he uh, he's a he was a big uh, contributor, right, to uh, to Trump, and he was like a, a very like overtly white supremacist writer, but also an academic. Who I believe what he he got taught at Yale and he, did he teach at Harvard? I don't he went know. went to school. And uh, who knows the Nazis, Matt? Not me. Listeners, yeah, I don't want not I a don't, Nazi. Matt, I is. don't want. <laughs> fuck, dude, I'm not. But I can't protest too much. Or you know, who knows? Uh, yeah, show me your tattoo. Show me your tattoo on your chest. <laughs> well, he no, he <laughs> his, his big thing is is now his <sighs> his comeback is. You know the whole sort of race realism stuff, right? Yes, that's what I was I was trying to say. He's yeah. a race realist and a, and a, a racialist, which, by the a, way, is not a thing. Fuck those people. Exactly, a racialist. But, yeah, a, a person in the in the in the high, you know, in the in the ivory tower, like spread, like telling his ideas, like lending lending an aura of of prestige and and science to it, and all this kind of stuff. 
and uh, also involved in in the government, uh, living in Japan now, mm. uh, <laughs> which is another funny thing, you know. As as there's like, I think there's a decent like neo Nazi uh, revitalization going on in Spain. Is that right? And then for whatever reason, there's a fetishization of of Japan uh also which is why you have you know things like anime avatars and a, a sort of like oriental fetishization of, of japan as like an orderly society well it's weird and i was also it, thinking of yeah i think that's a good point and it's weird because i mean that's another sort of example of you know it's and, it, and i think a lot of that is tied into masculinity and the sort of idolization of japan as a sort of women know their place and they're more submissive or whatever whatever but again i think this it's this it's a sort of similar phenomenon to what is hap what bolaño is describing in the book which is a culture sort of coping with its own problems by appealing to a distant culture on the other side of the world that they know nothing about as a right. sort of idealized you know i we want we want what they have yeah. I think and there's a little bit also of like uh is colonization like the white word like a, what is that when you're like when you I, idealize uh like basically any other like white culture. Is that colonization? Something like that? I don't know what you're I don't know. Well, I, it, I'm just thinking of this line that I underlined. Uh it was uh it was the, under the Gustavo Borda section. Okay. And because mm -hmm. I'm on Kindle, I don't know uh, it what page it's on. It starts on 108, Matt, for us. Okay. It's like the fourth paragraph down. It says, Gustavo Borda was just over five feet tall. He had a swarthy complexion, thick black hair, and enormous, very white teeth. His characters, by contrast, are tall, fair-haired, and blue-eyed. The spaceships mm -hmm. that appear in his novels are, <laughs> have, German, have German names. <laughs> and as funny as that line was, it made me just think of... Uh, you know, sort of in the way that like Korean girls will like get the surgery to like fix their fix quote unquote fix their eyes to make them look more American. I think there's a there was a little bit of that in maybe this character's Nazism is just like he's idealizing this romantic culture uh, because he might not respect his own culture. There's also maybe. Just like self self hatred it seems yeah. like uh, yeah like, i was trying to yeah books. like i was exactly i was trying to like not say self hatred i don't know why but yeah, yeah i was thinking he was just self hating himself and writing about these characters that are like very aryan yeah I, it's people who like like again it's a lot of manifestations of people who feel horror at whatever experience of themselves or their surroundings and and like the easy imposition of order immediately lends itself to like the kind of thinking that they're like the fascist thinking they're talking about. Cause like the other guy, whatever the Boca boys and the fucking, the, the soccer club um, guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's I hated, it? I hated that whole thing. I hated it. I yeah, just hate the know. term Boca, Boca boys. I hated that. Well, do, do you know what that's a reference to? I don't. No. What is oh, so one of the, it's a, it's a soccer team. The most, um, the most the most popular soccer team in Argentina is is is, is called Boca Juniors. Oh, and oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. the Boca boys are people who are, are you know they're fans of the team. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all right. But so you get these like it's not, it's not like the Proud Boys. No, it's far more organized and longstanding. Uh, but almost almost more stupid. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> They're both I hate stupid. Soccer hooligans are like the dumbest. Uh, I just hate it. It's Wayne, like we're in, a, we're in a game. Wayne Rooney. It's like you're in a <laughs> game. If you if you're gonna be in a gang, it's just like the least cool one you can be. Like you're not in a street gang. You're in a soccer club gang, and you're it makes gonna a fight. Lot of sense. I don't know. It I makes guess. sense to I don't me. Know. It's like the, the thing. The, anyway, what was the what was the why why are we bringing that? What what was the thought that? Oh, just like, you know, Paul's talking about this short, swarthy guy who's like, fuck, and he really wants to be a, a, an Aryan. Uh, uh, and then just like, what wasn't it one of the, um, it's two brothers, right? 
yeah. that both are the soccer gang. It's one it's of Fatso and I forget the other one's name. Didn't one of them get, you know, basically uh, <laughs> uh, Ginsburg was uh, tried to have sex with him. Yes. And that seemed to be the it, which was very funny. Like, but just like the, whoa, hey, fucking. And then immediately disgusted, like, I'm not gay. And then he joined the Boca Boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, the, the funny thing is there was a little bit of a pause in that in that description too, where it's like, it wasn't immediate. It was It was like, things kind of went a little, a little. And he's like, and then the man started to stroke him. And then he was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, hey. Yeah, hey, I'm not like that. What I'm the heck? I'm going to join the Boga Boys. <laughs> I'm going to join the Boga Boys. You can only eat Boca Burgers. But, but you know, so like there's that, those kind of <laughs> comically, shut up, man. We're just breezing <laughs> over it. We're just breezing over it. <laughs> you keep the train rolling. Uh yeah, so there's there's those like there's enough of those like funny and they're they're real things that like get people on that path, right? Horror, yeah. Horror mostly, but for those two persons we were just talking about, the guy, the short guy and the guy who uh almost, you know, gets asked to have gay sex, like <laughs> both of them yeah. find themselves disgusted at themselves. I think and therefore that's like the motivation and then you and then you just have yeah like hyper performative can... refutation of ever being anything close to that yeah i think you can surmise that that was the the reason he kicked off and joined the book of, i mean it's just it's such an offhanded like dry moment but it is mentioned so you have to kind of make that connection but who knows really either also, did you guys pick up on this? Like a fat so. so I've always I've been interested in like I've always I've always been interested in like the uh just the conservative streak in science fiction. Oh yeah. Uh um and I was reading the oh say so Gabe, it's the Zach Sodenstern segment at 104, page 104. Yep. And I believe uh, so. at, at 105, uh he's talking about two books he wrote revolution and the crystal cathedral uh which are installments in this saga about this boy and his german shepherd with telepathic powers and nazi tendencies yes <laughs> his dog flip um and i was like is that is that a harlan ellison a boy and his dog pot shot oh that's interesting yeah i didn't make that connection but that seems entirely plausible I know Ellison was like cantankerous and, and, a, and an asshole, but is he considered by some to be like, uh, is he conservative or like? Well, know, I'm not know. sure. I'm not sure about Ellison's politics. I, I mean, it it could be a reference without being a pot shot. It I could, guess that's true. It, it could just be a reference. Uh, I just find Bolaño to not really make, I, I mean, unnecessary reference. Yeah. A lot of the time, especially in something like this, which again, just on a writing level, is such a crystalline economy of words to describe the most information about people. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, High, Highland is one. I probably don't know enough about Ellison to make a judgment on that, but I'm glad that you brought up that section. I think the science fiction section might have been my favorite. Those three, it's very short, but like there's a lot yeah. in there that I really enjoyed. And in the in the probably because you read so many Star Wars books. I do love Star Wars books. Currently, <laughs> I was just reading before we got on. I'm reading a, a new, the new Rebellion, which is really good. Sick. And uh, yeah, I recommend it. Um, I do love the Star Wars EU, which is still canon in my mind. Disney can go to hell. That's true. That's and, that, and that's the official Spinecracker stance. In fact, on that. The official Spinecracker stance is that the old Star Wars EU is still canon, even right. if it's not, even if it's contradictory. We contain multitudes, and the world's complicated. That's right. Okay. So this is on 106, Matt. That next page, and this is another moment that I felt like Bolaño was doing some like self, some self crit, as it were, some self referential discussion. <laughs> <laughs> A little struggle session for himself. Exactly. So he's talking about uh, Sodenstern's book, Checking the Maps, 
and says, checking the maps opens the Fourth Reich saga. It is full of appendices, maps, incomprehensible indices of proper names, and solicits an interaction in which, <laughs> in which no sensible reader would persist. The events take place. Uh, the events take place mainly in Denver and midwestern cities. There is no main character. The less chaotic stretches read like collections of stories haphazardly tacked together. And I wondered if that wasn't like Bolaño, like doing a little like self-referential uh, uh, moment. I also thought- yeah. When I read that, uh, I was just gonna say when I read that, I was like. Isn't that the book I'm reading right now? <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, he's a cheeky postmodernist sometimes, you know. He he puts himself in other books too. Right. I this was another So does Paul Oster. Yeah. This was another so Paul Oster. This was another segment that I was like uh <laughs> Are you trying to draw a comparison like a direct comparison? No, I'm just saying the last book is pretty good. You gave it a low score. It was a pretty good book. <laughs> <laughs> we're nazi numerical value givers <laughs> has to follow rigorous form uh no it was it was this segment uh 128 it was the max mirabelli alias max casimir max von hoffman character max Laguille. <laughs> this was and, so this was the guy who plagiarized everything he wrote yes okay yeah um which again felt like I felt like a bit of the thesis of the whole book was also in this part on page 128. Uh, you know, timorous by nature, appalled by the mere sight of blood. This is right at the top. Uh, you know, so this is him. Oh, sorry. It might be better to have a little. Yeah. He soon realized that there were only two ways to achieve his aim through violence, which was out of the question since he was peaceable and timorous and appalled by the sight of blood. Uh, or through literature, which is a surreptitious form of violence, a passport to respectability, and can, in certain young and sensitive nations, disguise the social climber's origins. Yes. And, like, that also felt like a, a, a harsh little, like, self-mortification on Bologna's part occasionally. Yes. Well, and I think that whole section, too, is really interesting because it's it feels like... So there are writers that are explicitly referenced and also like formally referenced. So this is a guy who basically did like a Pessoa thing and created, uh, Bolaño uses the term heteronym, which Pessoa yeah. invented. And this guy creates a bunch of heteronyms to sort of, in order to continue his plagiarism habit, <laughs> which is <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> um, Gotta do it, man. Yeah. So uh, yes, I think that's that's a good, a good catch, man. Um, okay, I want to go back and read one more section from the, this is in the sci-fi section, and this is from the JMS Hill, uh, who is, you know, was an American sci-fi writer who's, and I thought, like, to me, this was one of the most, like, striking sections of the entire book, because it was, like, it just shows how, like, like, like fertile Bolaño's literary imagination was. This whole book is a demonstration of that, but this section is like, it goes even deeper. Um, so he's describing the, the sort of pulpy sci-fi novels that this guy wrote. Um, and he says, his plots abound, this is on 102, Matt, if you wanna. Okay. It says, his plots abound in providential heroes and mad scientists, hidden clans and tribes, which at the ordained time must emerge and do battle with other hidden tribes. Secret societies of men in black who meet at isolated ranches on the prairie. Private detectives who must search for people on lost, uh, lost on other planets. Children stolen and raised by inferior races so that having reached adulthood, they may take control of the tribe and lead it to immolation. Unseen <laughs> animals with insatiable appetites. Mutant plants, invisible planets that suddenly become visible. Teenage girls offered as human sacrifices. Cities of ice with a single inhabitant. Cowboys oh, like that. Cowboys visited by angels. Mass, mi mass migrations destroying everything in their path. Underground labyrinths swarming with warrior monks. Plots to assassinate the president of the United States. Spaceships fleeing an earth in flames to colonize Jupiter. Societies of telepathic killers. Children growing up all alone in dark, cold yards. 
And I was just like, that's just like so like, what the fuck? It was it's so <laughs> wonderful. And I'm like, I want to read all of those books. Like he makes you want to read. Yeah. He makes you want to read the books and the work written by these people he's describing. Yes. Yeah. And it's and it's disturbing to feel that way. Mm-hmm. And it's I like that. Although Cities of Vice with a single inhabitant, is that just Superman? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, he's considered by some a fascist character. That's Could deep. Be. I was okay, thinking more about Yoda. That's, that's interesting. Wait, did Superman come from a city of ice? No, but his Fortress of Solitude is oh, okay. a massive ice thing that he made for himself. It's stretch, maybe. I don't know. I actually think... I actually think because that we know this book was written in at least 2029. I I think he's probably talking about Elsa <laughs> from Frozen. Oh, you could be Frozen 2 probably. Yeah. Let probably. it go. Let it go. Do you <laughs> some more lyrics? Well, I was actually thinking that it would be <laughs> funny if there was I think that you know, he's talking about literature, but I think it'd be cool if there was Nazi, like, rock music. Elsa? Not, like, not like punk. I know there's oh. Nazi punk. There's plenty of Nazi punk. But I thought it'd yeah. be funny if there was, like, Nazi, like, Christian-style rock. Like, fucking, like... Isn't there? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I was, is, I, but... I was thinking, like, Nazi hoobastank, basically. <laughs> like, where it's, like, like salt, like, radio rock, but it's Nazi. And so it's, like... <laughs> And the reason is the Jews. <laughs> there you go. We got to the punchline <laughs> and it was worth it. <laughs> we should make a fake band and write fake Nazi inspired music. I think it should be called Nazi Who Mistake. I uh <laughs> can I Nazi I wanna sh- I wanna I, I will attribute this to uh the Twitter account logo dataless uh for saying the Jewish question. All I'm fucking hearing is the Jewish answer to every fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great encapsulation. I think we should quote what you just said when we tweet out this episode, and then it'll be Matt's point of view on Nazism. Matt's just own un- Matt's Matt's unique, made it fully original quote. Uh, <laughs> I was also thinking a lot of um, <laughs> well, this book also made me like do a lot of research, which I like. Yes, uh, and have to look up a lot of shit. Um, so, you know, like I didn't know what a phalangist was, uh, had to look up that and learn about the Spanish civil war. Uh, there was a, a, a president of Mexico who I was looking up whose name I already forgot. Cause you know, my brain is a sieve, but, um, doing some Mexican, re- uh, historical research was kind of a fun thing to do. I like this aspect of things. I like things with heavy references. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> We were making fun at one point of uh, not on this, you know, like earlier we were talking about Dave Rubin and just being like, wow, I think I better strap on my thinking cap for all these high level ideas <laughs> and whatever. And uh, and in the phalangist description, they they're quoted as like defending their position, one being like sort of called fascist or or just you know Nazis. They're like, no, we're we're. We're none of those things. We're not left or right, man. We're like I'm just like I'm just like a free thinker and like a cap a capital L liberal and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it was in the fuck. Sorry, I didn't reference this, but the uh, Argentino Fatso Chiafino book or section on page uh, one seventy five, uh, where Chiafino makes his political position clear. Uh. <laughs> from his own point of view, at least. He is neither on the right nor the left. He has black friends and friends in the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> 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 Among photos in the book, one shows a barbecue in a backyard. All the guests are wearing clan hoods and gowns, except for Shiafino, who is in chef's garb, using a spare white hood to wipe his, the sweat from his neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking of the phalangist description of the same idea, which is that they call the syncretic third position Right. Uh, which you, I feel like you hear all the time now as well when people are defending their political beliefs a lot of the time is they're in some sort of something third position. You know what I mean? 
like the third position, the third way, the non left or right, anything that's not, you know, the stereotype of left or right is a third position, I guess. And in that spectrum, there's a lot of people trying to weasel their way into, <laughs> you know, Fuck, avoiding yeah. hard conversations. Right. It's like, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, but it's also always sort of, sort of, um, you know, uh, buoyed by a sort of like faux ignorance about like, I don't know, man, I'm just, I'm just, it's like, you know, it's like the Tim, it's like Tim pool. You know what I mean? Like it's I like, did a little bit. Huh? Like I was doing a little bit with my little song and dance. I'm yeah. Just a, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, oh, I don't know. Who knows? You know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying what, what happened. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not a scientist. Oh, I, I can't know. ask questions. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, at, yeah. I, I think that that was very sort of well, <laughs> well played there by Bologna in terms of describing <laughs> that phenomenon. Did you guys like the book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to know. Well, okay, hold on. I want to find one more. I want to find, there's one more thing that I'm looking for. I do I, want, I can't, I do want it. to talk about, okay. Let me talk about my, the section that I like the most that we haven't talked about besides the sci-fi section, because I love sci-fi. Um, well, it was early on, there was a, a writer who, I, I think she was maybe like a poet, it was like the third or fourth little section, where she was like, I think she was pretty prolific, and then she ends up like falling in love with another woman, and yes. remember that one? Yep. Yeah. I liked that one a lot. Like, it was super tragic. She, ha I think she had like a uh, a publishing, or like she run, ran a magazine or something that was like anti-gay and anti- blacks and stuff like that and she just she wrote poems in that vein in like the nazi vein and then she like dated a bunch of men but then she fell in love with this woman who was like a left-wing writer i think she was a writer but anyway i found that that story to be like very tragic and very just it was just a sad story uh yeah i ended up like feeling for that character a lot and just being like, wow, the choices you made in your life have all this been shit. And now this woman that you love, like, won't even give you the time of day. And I think the woman wasn't even a lesbian, though. So it was just like full on, full on tragic for this woman. And she like pursued her and pursued her. And she was just, she but if, got I, her. if I remember the rest of that story, like, yeah, it was sad in that she was rejected. And, and, uh, but like, I think the conclusion is, is that they ended up, it was one of the few, like, vaguely reformed sounding characters where like they ended up she and that woman ended up having like a fruitful friendship correspondence, yeah. friendship and correspondence of like mutually like growing by arguing kind of thing it was like one of the few one of like maybe the only time that happened in the book yep. as described uh so i don't think it was full tragic but it was sad fine so okay, so right. here's the, here's the second. <laughs> here's the speaking of sad, and and the Fuck sort of Paul. psychological <laughs> psychological analysis that Bolaño does of these people. This this is like in some ways to me the one of the takeaways, and I think this is so applicable today when we think about right wing movements and sort of like, you know, some of these, you know, Nazi adjacent figures that exist today in our politics. Uh, this is Gustavo Borda again, who we've referenced before. That's so, right? Uh, no, this is actually going back to the sci-fi section. Matt, it's on 108 to 109. Uh, and this is a little oh, yeah. bit of a long, a little bit of a long section, but I'm gonna read the whole thing. Um Borda preferred blondes, and his insatiable libido was legendary, provoking innumerable jokes and jeers. Given the ease with which he fell in love and took offense, his life was one long series of indignities. <laughs> which, he endured, which he endured with the fortitude of a wounded beast. Anecdotes about his life in California abound, yet there are a few about his life in Guatemala where he came to be regarded, albeit briefly, as the nation's great writer. It is said that he was a favorite target for all the sadists in Hollywood, that he fell in love with at least five actresses, four secretaries, and seven waitresses, every one of whom rejected him, deeply wounding his pride. Uh, that on one, on more than one occasion, he was brutally beaten up by his brothers, friends, or lovers of the woman in question. That his own friends took pleasure in getting him catatonically drunk and leaving him lying in a heap wherever. <laughs> that, he was, that he was fleeced by his agent, his landlord, and his neighbor. 
the Mexican screenwriter and science fiction author Alfredo de Maria, that his presence at meetings and conferences of North American science fiction writers was a source of sarcastic, scornful amusement. Borda, as opposed to the majority of his colleagues, had not even a rudimentary knowledge of science. His ignorance in the field of astronomy, astrophysics, quantum theory, and information technology was proverbial. That his mere existence, in short, brought out the basest, most deeply hidden instincts in the people whose paths he crossed for one reason or another in the course of his life. There is, however, no evidence to suggest that any of this demoralized him. In his diaries, he blames the Jews and usurers for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just think that that is such a perfect picture of the reductive mentality of, of like so many <laughs> people it's like I have all of these personal failings all of these things have gone wrong in my life for reasons both both attributable to me and outside of my control and I need a sort of coherent way to make sense of it all therefore it's the Jews and the usurers <laughs> yeah just like it could not be me <laughs> or, like, even, it or, or, it makes... or even the things or even the things that aren't me the things that are genuinely random genuinely yes uh outside of my control there must be a coherent explanation behind all of it right right it made me think of like incel culture absolutely yes yeah yeah there you go i was uh i was just looking up jerry taylor on wikipedia <laughs> And uh, it just it's so funny, even just right at the beginning, like the publications he is involved with could be joke publications that Bologna wrote in, in the back bibliography. So yeah. like you've got you've got, a, a, you know, editor at American Renaissance, the Council of Conservative Citizens and the Occidental Quarterly. <laughs> <laughs> like. It just it, it proves Bologna's brilliance in parodying these people because like there's things in the back of there that are like you know just the same it's the same I really like Occidental Quarterly Occidental Quarterly amazing <laughs> like what the fuck that literally could be in this book I was thinking of Attack on Titan as well why it's supposed to be about it's supposed to be fascist oh okay you know I need to watch that is that that's anime right yeah, it's anime. I don't know. Same is Matt. It's supposedly the same good. Studio, it's the same studio that did uh, the Vinland uh, Saga. Vinland Saga. Yeah. Yeah, which is great. So good. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta watch it again. Oh no. Uh. You know, just just a uh, uh, beautiful Aryan-looking people in a in a. European style walled village fighting off ugly, disgusting monsters. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Well, so, what did we think of this, Paul? Paul, uh, <laughs> I think I, I think I got a lot out of I got a lot out of the discussion. I, I wouldn't say that I enjoyed reading as as a book, like just as a as a read. I didn't really enjoy it. I think he's a good writer. I just, I don't really find myself drawn to kind of short snippet sporadic writing that doesn't have a cohesive story. I think without, or like throughout our book club, I've come to that realization more. Like I, I like more of a simp li uh, linear story. <laughs> um, simp story? <laughs> uh, so it was, it was kind of middle of the road for me. Like I, I, I I don't really enjoy having to look stuff up while I'm reading. I know you said you like that, Matt. I don't really enjoy that. I'd rather just like read and enjoy the ride. <laughs> I Paul, can, can uh, I can I interject really quick though? I yeah. this is definitely from my experience of him very different. I would actually say he's exactly the kind of writer you would enjoy in his narrative stuff. Yeah, I mean like, that being said, I did I did look up his other books and i i think i am interested in reading something else of his i i think he's so. genuinely incredible storyteller he's not off he's not off the table for me but i didn't particularly love this book or hate it it was kind of middle of the road yeah this is the yeah this is a very experimental for him uh well so yeah 
I think maybe maybe we should set the standard that the person who picked the book has to go last so they don't influence the rest of us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I was just thinking. I just made that rule up just now on the spot. So It's good, though. It's a good rule. And I also right, think that I wanted to sort of say but you know about it like I I am in terms of my tastes almost the diametric opposite of Paul. Like I I I have no interest, not no interest, but it 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 I, I actively seek out things that fuck with form, fuck with linearity, and like I, I don't particularly care if there's a story or a main character or any of that. And and so this worked for me a lot, really a lot. Um, and I've, I've only read um, 2666. I, I'm not a Bolaño uh, uh, aficionado by any means. Um, yeah, me neither. But uh, I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this deeply. I mean, I think, I do think there's, you know, it, it, there were, there were moments that I felt, uh, okay, like I get it. You know what I mean? All right. Yeah. Okay. I get the point. Um, right. But so, so it, it, it maybe felt overextended in some ways to me. Um, but I think that the, the themes and the, what's there is so worth mining that I, I, I deeply enjoyed reading it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was a little nervous based on the, the form, but, uh, I, yeah, I loved it. I thought it, it, in the same way that the segment in 2666 where it's just this horrific dry accounting of dead girls and disappeared women from yep. you know a thinly veiled uh Ciudad Juarez uh it's like i found the compounding effect worked on me emotionally where initially you're like all right well you know this tone's a little dry it's very droll and then like suddenly you're like i don't know i'm 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 feeling the dread that i think is always it, it, that i think is the intention uh in terms of what it's trying to elicit from you the discomfort and the dread um yeah i liked it a lot and i think that last i really want to just pause on that last story for an, an additional second because i think that in some ways is the not the point of the book, but it really brings it, it really ties it up in a bow, right? Like where it's this last story that is just this basically it, it, it first person narrative short story. And to me, that really brought me back in, in a way that I was like, this is doing something different than I thought it was the whole time. And it's much more sort of self-reflective and it sort of, it sort of put Bolaño's cards on the table that this is also him working through some some shit as we've been talking about, right? Whether that's him working through the the sort of South American flirtation with Nazism as a political thing, or his own, you know, uh, political thoughts or or whatever. I think that 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 really added a lot for me that that final story. Yeah, and I mean, so much so for him even that yeah, I believe it's an entire novel a to yeah. its own self. Should we? Unfortunately, uh, we can't do the. Can we? We can't really do the Harry Potter thing. That would well, be unwieldy. Well, okay. So <laughs> if, we can pick like one or two. So here's here's my proposal. Yeah. So on this podcast, it's the uh, uh, fan favorite segment uh, <laughs> that we call. We literally just read another book, where we mm -hmm. get to indulge in some Harry Potter, uh, you know, house assignment fantasies. Mm. In, this is uh, definitely book. This does not lend itself to that. That this is an actively hostile book to that whole practice. There are so many characters, and you know so little about many of them. Here's my proposal: we each pick the person that stuck out to us as most interesting, and assign them a house. And I'll go first in order to give you guys a little time if you haven't thought about this already. Fuck. Uh, but my. <laughs> My favorite character that we didn't talk about really at all um, in the in the discussion, so I'm, I, I feel extra motivated to bring him up, was um, Willy Schurholtz, who was a a German uh, who was born in Argentina, I believe, 
I believe it's Argentina. But basically there's a sort of uh, uh, Midsommar style German ethnic compound that is um, in South America and he was he's born there and he is yeah. sort of um, ideologically sort of uh, uh, indoctrinated into German Nazism growing up in South America in this weird commune compound thing. And he, from a young age, starts doing these literary works that are um, deeply sort of weird and experimental and they're filled with numbers and fragmentary lines of prose that physically on the page start to form maps if you zoom out on them. And over time, it turns out that he was he was in prose on the page, drawing maps of the concentration camps from the Holocaust. <laughs> and it, 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 that it gradually becomes apparent that that's what he was doing. And he, he, he becomes a sort of darling of a sort of hipster literary class in, the, in North America. Yeah. And he's brought to Arizona to do one of these pieces in the desert. Um, and I, I loved this character both because he just felt, he felt very, as bizarre as his story is, he felt super real to me, both as like someone who could sort of exist and precisely as the type of person who would be like picked up by edgy, you know, 60s art people and flown out to the Arizona desert to like do a prose map of Dachau in the day, in the fucking- oh, man desert or something that would that would be better than food man <laughs> <laughs> i think that would be worse than food um, <laughs> but but he would i i mean and and so he does these books uh that are just called that are just called like geometry one geometry two and geometry three and i just i th i want to read those 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 were among my my top yeah the top things that I would like to read of the things that are described in this book. So Willie Sherholtz is, is, it was my favorite character. And I think he would be, um, <laughs> I think he would be a, a, I don't know if he'd be a Ravenclaw cause he's not like an academic. He doesn't like pursue knowledge. He just kind of like habitually draws <laughs> concentration camp maps. Um, he's kind of like autistically yeah, fixated. Yeah. So maybe, certainly not a helpful i think he's a gryffindor he just it ha is single-mindedly pursuing what he thinks is the thing yeah that's a i think that's a good assessment uh you have we didn't, to... well you sprung that you sprung that little this little thought experiment on us quick i'm sorry uh it's all right i i'm gonna st i'm gonna stick with louise fontaine de souza nice the motherfucker who was writing 700 page books <laughs> denouncing uh Diderot and D'Alembert and fucking Voltaire it's funny be I, one of the reasons I chose this guy and the reason he stood out and Rousseau you know reputation of Rousseau Montesquieu uh when I was um in college I went to uh the creationist museum in did you Oklahoma. really yeah I did in wow. when it opened like the like it, it had been open for like a month um and uh, at the end of the, it's kind of like this, it's funny because it uses all the aesthetics and like means of, of signaling uh, and, and presenting information in the way that like the fucking cosmopolitan or like, you know, you know what I mean? Like the Smithsonian would do or something like this or like uh, Liberty Science Center. But it was all about how like the flood is possible and how people live with dinosaurs uh, at one point in harmony and all this <laughs> it's it's amazing there's an animatronic raptor that uh, is eating an apple out of a very Aryan young girl's hand <laughs> holy shit like an amazing museum to go to f to just see the shit it's uh, in Kentucky I think right Kentucky yes um and and at the end it's like this is it's like a whole like uh cautionary like this is where we're headed the the sinner you know if sinners override christians and stuff and it's like it looked like inner city new york uh the their their vision of hell on earth and uh 
there was all this list of of thinkers who sort of took us to this place and it's and it's literally these people that you know D'Souza is writing these refutations of which I just like so I just I, I found it extra funny that's really and, interesting yeah in particular Voltaire they had a big fucking problem with in that museum uh so it was just like extra funny extra lols for that and uh yeah just the idea of a guy writing these insanely long just arguments is just something i i think i I just see enough in real life and where and and to have it be yeah painted at the end is just a absolute fucking waste of time and your and your life (laughs) and to have meant nothing yes uh i was that's real that's real to me (laughs) and this guy's ravenclaw this guy's the worst kind of ravenclaw that's true. Yeah, that is Ravenclaw gone wrong, gone wild. Um, I was just looking up the Creation Museum just now, and it looks like their um, their Christmas light display is pretty fucking lit. Honestly, yeah. I mean, listen, it's well funded. It seems, and it's and it, it's nice. Like, I would go to it. There's a lot of um Pennsylvania Dutch and like people there and stuff, and it's like, hey, listen, the flood. You know, that's why there's fossils this kind of you know the, all those kind of stuff like they're really like anxious about science which is an interesting thing to notice like right they give you the full like i said like liberty science center <laughs> like treatment where you go into like a, a room and watch like a a, a a you know a surround sound like 3d video about the flood and stuff and it's like explaining why that's there's oil <laughs> it's 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 great did you feel like someone was gonna like come up behind you and put their hand on your shoulder and be like, "What are you doing here? You, we, you don't belong here." Did, did were, you have that? They could, they could smell the Brooklyn on you, man. Yeah. Oh God. I mean, if anyone doesn't know, I look like the absolute fucking like a child's drawing of a of a of a Brooklynite. <laughs> uh, I <laughs> like a this fucking hipster stencil, but like, uh, yeah, I actually did. Um, there was a point where when I got to the, like, here's hell on earth. And it was basically the Bronx where I, I was going to school. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I started laughing and I, and it, it, I, I got nervous that people were going to be like, this is the least funny part of the exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to be afraid at this part. Paul, who do you think, uh, uh, who was your favorite? Do they have a hat and what's their house? And what's their house? I think I'm going to stick with, uh, Hold on. What's her name? Luz Medeluce Thompson. Uh-huh. Medeluce Thompson, the, the mm-hmm. woman I talked about earlier. Yep. I think that, that was the most gripping story for me. Uh, I think she would probably be a... I'm going to say Gryffindor. Ooh. Couple, a, lot of Gryffindor, a, strong, a lot of Gryffindors this time. I mean, she's borderline Slytherin for sure, but... They're fast. I'm just going to... Oh yeah, what? the same way that Hufflepuff can rape, Gryffindor can be fash. They have their fucking yeah, right totally. stag, yeah. Totally. Nice. Well, before we go to scores, the one thing that I want to just note is that uh, I want to read one more passage, if I may, because it's about Ernst Jünger, who <laughs> is oh, a good guy. Interesting yeah. character in the in the cosmology of this podcast. Um, he gets worked over a bit. He gets worked over a bit in this in this book. And there's a there's one character who specifically has dreams about Ernst Jünger fucking Lenny Vi- Reifenstahl. <laughs> <laughs> but as like old people. But as old people. But as really yeah. really old people. Um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the part about them having sex, uh, but it's worth it's worth reading. Um, so this is Rory Long, who's an American sort of evangelical preacher who's described in the book. And I'll just read this and then we can go to scores. But what was this, but what is the secret of longevity? Purity, searching, working, preparing for the millennium on various levels. And some nights he felt that he was touching the body of the new man with the tips of his fingers. He lost a hundred pounds. Ernst and Lenny were fucking in the sky for him. 
and he realized that this was no vulgar if torrid hypnotic therapy but the veritable host of fire then he went completely crazy and cunning occupied every nook of his body he had money fame and good lawyers he had radio stations newspapers magazines and television networks and he had robust good health until one midday in March of 2017, when a young African American man named Baldwin Rocha blew his head off. End of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is the like summary deaths of these people it's, that is like it's so sad and and weird and awesome. Right. I did. I did wonder why so many of them got murdered, though. Why? There were so many murders. Well, I don't know if there were a lot of murder. There were definitely a lot of unceremonious deaths. Like there were a lot of just like, yeah, just like yeah, like random, right. random deaths. All right, let's um assign some scores here, Paul. Uh, two point nine. That's petty. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm gonna go with 3.86. Damn, I was gonna go 3.82. Damn, nice. All right, great minds. Um, <laughs> genius, brilliant <laughs> minds. <laughs> Paul. Not enough sci fi for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. not enough it. main. Let's- Let's rate it on sci-fi elements. Honestly, I would say, I would say it's like a it's it's like a it's like a one point seven for me on sci-fi elements, just because that it's written from the perspective of in the future and the, the future those man weird, those weird date date de- death dates is that's that's and, pretty, well, and the and the sci-fi descriptions in the sci-fi chapters were pretty fucking. Sci-fi. You know what? I'm bumping it up to a two point two. There were enough. Co- sci-fi concepts in that one paragraph yes to really just to you could just write a fucking book about all of those things absolutely individually yeah, what was i'm gonna p- give that a two plants two on appear sci-fi. and reappear i like that. i don't know about yeah. that or no what was it fucking cool i want to know about that good sci-fi elements yeah maybe you almost want to read a sci-fi book instead we should for example, <laughs> I mean, okay, I heard about a really cool, like, post-apocalyptic sci-fi book. It's called Oomsville by Ernst J. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. I knew it. I heard it coming. That's right. The Condor's watching. I will say, uh, no spoilers, but my my next pick, so we are reading my my pick will be next week, but the pick that I have lined up after that is a sci-fi novel, so... Thank God. Right on. Right on. All right, everybody. Uh, this has been Spinecrackers, and we've been talking about Roberto Bolan- Roberto Bolaños. Thank you. Nazi literature in the Americas. Matt's pick. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. I'm Paul. Bye. Take it greasy. That's Paul. <laughs>